And uh, first of all, apologies for the slight delay in getting started. We were supposed to start at 12.15, but had a, a few unexpected technical difficulties with the technology, but we should be okay. Welcome to everybody here in person. And I'd also like to welcome those of you who are joining us on Zoom. Uh, welcome to this seminar in the STL, STL, which stands for our law school, Peking University School of Transnational Law, Beijing Dashu Guoji Fa Yin's Law and Humanities Seminar Series, Fa Lu Yun Wen Xi Lie Jiang Zuo. Uh, my name is Norman Ho. I teach at the law school, and we're very privileged today to have as our guest speaker, Professor Christopher Roberts from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Roberts is a legal historian. Uh, he works on various areas in legal history, including British legal history, the legal history of the British Empire, and also the legal history of workers' rights and labor law from a transnational and international perspective. Uh, he's the author of uh, Alternative Approaches to Human Rights, which came out with in Cambridge University Press in 2022, as well as various uh, scholarly articles. At the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Professor Roberts also chairs the Transnational Legal History Group, which is based at the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Professor Roberts will speak to us today on the topic of discretion and the rule of law, the significance and endurance of vagrancy and vagrancy type laws in England, the British Empire and the British colonial world. He will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we will open the floor for questions. I would like to give the floor now to Professor Roberts. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, uh, first of all, to Professor Norman Ho for the very kind uh, invitation uh, and to the Peking University School of Transnational Law for hosting me here today. It is my great uh, honor and privilege uh, to be with you all and to speak about one of uh, uh, my areas of research. Uh, so I should say the presentation today uh, is based on a paper published last year in the Duke Journal of Comparative and International Law. So if you want more details, uh, you can find them there. Um, uh, it was also supported by Early Career Scheme Grant number 24601320 uh, from the Hong Kong Research Grants Council. So my thanks uh, to them as well. So, okay, what does this, uh, uh, what did this project, what does this paper do? Uh, well, the central object, as you can see already, uh, is it focuses on the significance and endurance of vagrancy and vagrancy type laws with this very broad uh, transnational focus. So what is a vagrancy law, right? If you're asking yourself that question, you wouldn't be alone. Uh, it is a, right, one, it's kind of a obs slightly obscure area of law as such. Uh, secondly, even if you get into it, these laws by their nature have an inherent vagueness built into them. So even if you start to learn more about them, what exactly they are, um, perhaps it, it's not that it's quickly answered, rather it perhaps becomes even more of a question than it was uh, 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 at, at the first moment. Uh, but hopefully my talk today will help to introduce you to, to these laws, um, some of their history, the different usages and particular times and places um, uh, so you can understand them a little better. Here at the beginning, I would just like to note that broadly speaking, these laws punish, you know, a category typically known as the vagrant, which is somehow understood as encompassing and targeting those who are seen as poor, as criminal, as somehow immoral, and or as itinerant, meaning people who move around. Okay, so my paper picks up mostly uh, the history of these laws from the 19th century. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would argue and suggest that they really take on a new life in that period. Uh, but just so we're all kind of situated a little bit, I will give a little prehistory to that as well. So in the British tradition, vagrancy laws are often traced to the, 19, uh, the 1349 and 1351 uh, statutes of laborers. These were laws that were enacted in the wake of the Black Death. So this massive uh, period of disease that swept through the population, you know, very, very dramatic social transformation, very dramatic reduction in the number, just the, the absolute numbers uh, of, of people. 
And the typical understanding of these measures is that they were enacted to deal with this problem that arose in the wake of, of the, the plague uh, sweeping through society. And that problem was that the number of workers had dramatically diminished. The feudal lords wanted to get the same work for the same deal as it were they had had before. But now the bargaining power of the workers had increased because there were many, many fewer of them, right? So their, their labor was actually much more valuable than it was before. Were well, these statutes of laborers constituted the uh, government of England, such as it was, putting a thumb on the scales uh, by criminally penalizing individuals who moved around in search of work or who remained idle, who didn't take up work, right? So you could be criminally penalized. Um, if you don't work or if you, you know, leave your district, you could be sent back um, uh, 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 under these measures. Even as the Black, day, the Black Death uh, passed, um, time moves on, this type of legal measure does not go away. So we have various different sort of, you know, there's, there's sort of a long list of them. Again, this isn't the period I mostly focus on, but there are, there are many, many different iterations of this over the centuries. Um, the, the Vagabond Acts in the 16th century, the Rogue and Vagabond Acts in the 18th century. And sometimes in places, the punishment becomes very, very extreme. It's you, People will be put to death for violating these laws. Um, at some moments, uh, those who are penalized under these laws are sent to, you know, when, when sort of settler colonialism is getting underway in North America, individuals penalized under these laws will be sent over um, to say, you know, the, the, what will become the United States uh, as, as workers. Okay, so, but as I said, right, so that's some prehistory to the period of time I really want to focus on. And the starting point of the modern vagrancy law era, uh, I would suggest, is the 1824 Vagrancy Act um, uh, in England. This was passed in the wake of several decades of social turbulence. So in the 1790s, there was extensive protest uh, against the government uh, in England. This was a period when the French Revolution was happening, right? So it was sort of lesser known, there was similarly a kind of a movement in favor of ju just a little bit more representation in England that was very forcefully suppressed by the authorities at the time. That suppression was somewhat successful for the first decade of the 19th century, but by the second decade of the 19th century, resistance was increasing uh, again. Uh, in fact, in that period, in the 1810s, this is the period of the Luddites. If some of you know about, about the Luddites, smashing machinery, but also just generally these broad social protests uh, in fact, you know, England was engaged in the war with Napoleon in France. In fact, little known, an army as large as that deployed to France was in the north of England at that same moment in time to keep a lid on social unrest, right? So that tells you how seriously uh, they took this issue. In uh, 1819, there was a, a sort of particular moment of suppression known as the Peterloo Massacre, um, where the authorities um, uh, massacred several uh, protesters. There was a sweep of repressive measures um, passed in the wake of that massacre, limiting freedom of the press, freedom of assembly. Um, those measures also increased the ability of magistrates to deny those accused of misdemeanors bail and to convict them through summary proceedings. So this is all happening in 1819. Then five years later in 1824, we have this Vagrancy Act um, as well, right? So I want to suggest that it should be understood as coming out of that particular context. Okay, so thinking about turning to the text of the Vagrancy Act, um, what does it do? Uh, there are two key issues I would like to uh, highlight. First, the sort of substantive side. What does it look like substantively? How is a vagrant defined? And second, the procedural side, which I would suggest, you know, tends to get less intention, but uh, is actually very, very important as well. So on the substantive side, the, the 1824 Vagrancy Act um, basically has three levels of vagrant. The first level is an idle and disorderly person. Uh, and there are uh, multiple different ways you can fall under this heading. So if you're able uh, to maintain yourself, able to work, uh, but you're willfully refusing or neglecting to do so, so you could work, but you're not working, um, then you can be deemed a vagrant and criminally penalized. 
every petty chapman or peddler wandering abroad and trading without being duly licensed. So in other words, street traders, that is another category of vagrants. Uh, every common prostitute wandering in the public streets, so sex workers, another category of just this first level of vagrants. Or every person wandering around, uh, wandering abroad or placing himself or herself in any public place to beg or gather alms, so begging in public, right? This is another category of uh, the basic type of vagrant. So already we have, you know, you can see there's a number of different types of things that are covered here, um, including simply not working as such. Then there's a second order vagrant, which is also known as a rogue or vagabond. Uh, and if you thought we already had a lot of different sorts of ways of falling under this law, there's even more here. So everyone pretending or professing to tell fortunes or using any subtle craft, means or device by palmistry or otherwise to deceive. So, you know, telling fortunes, this sort of thing um, in the colonial context, practice, this will come to encompass practicing sort of traditional religions uh, as well. Every person wandering abroad and without regular home, not having any visible means of subsistence and not giving a good account of himself or herself. So basically being poor in public uh, is uh, a, a way uh, of uh, becoming a rogue or vagabond as well. Uh, every person willfully exposing to view any obscenity or obscenely exposing their own person. Uh, beggars who are sort of you know, the, the already beggars were encompassed, but if they're exposing wounds or deformities as part of the act of begging, they, they move up to a level two uh, vagrant, which is a rogue or vagabond. Uh, people running away, leaving their family without uh, providing them with a form of support. Public gambling so was used a lot by the British in, in the 19th century in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, or every person being found in or upon any public place for any unlawful purpose, every suspected person found in a public place with intent to commit felony, right? In other words, if you're suspicious, simply being suspicious, if the, which means if the authorities think you're suspicious, you can be found to fall under this category uh, as well. Um, and then there's a third level, which is an incorrigible rogue, uh, which just means doing these things uh, more than once. So, okay, so what do we already see from all of this? Um, as I noted at the beginning, there was already a long history to these laws prior to the 19th century. Um, but I would suggest even within that context, the 1824 Vagrancy Act, you know, goes really, really far in terms of making this a measure, which is sort of, it's a compendium of different types of actions or activities all put under a single uh, sort of legal heading or put within the same measure. I would suggest that's doing a whole lot of different things. I mean, one of them, uh, I think, is that, so already it's a very broad and vague term, but by having all of these different types of, of things falling under it that you could be accused of constituting the same act, that, that magnifies the broadness and vagueness, right? And it's even without thinking about the fact that, you know, the last one is just being suspicious, which is already more or less susceptible to whatever application uh, the authorities might like. I think combining various different types of activities, sort of poverty, again, uh, kind of being itinerant, moving around, suggestions of immorality and sort of, you know, uh, sex work or obscenely exposing oneself to view. There's this, this sense of immorality attached to this category. So we have all of these different ideas that are somehow merged together by this law in a way that I think increases the sense of threat, the sense of opprobrium attaching to those um, who might be targeted by it. And I also, you know, another thing I would like to suggest is that, so it might be the case that um, every law is not only about sort of capturing something that already exists in reality, but also about constructing social reality to a certain extent. But I would still say there's a spectrum within laws and the law like this, the Vagrancy Act is maximally on the side of constructing reality, right? There's no, you know, there's nothing really that is a vagrant per se. It doesn't exist prior to this act of definition. Uh, so this law is kind of creating a category. It's um, uh, uh, informing the way people think about society um, in, in quite subtle but effective ways. So these are the substantive provisions and that's, there's already a lot going on um, just there.
but in addition, I would like to suggest that the procedural provisions of this law are equally as uh, important. And in fact, the majority of provisions in this law were procedural ones. Uh, so among other things, the 1824 Vagrancy Act allowed uh, any person to apprehend another under its terms, right? So, you know, if, if Norman decides I'm a vagrant after this talk, he can, he can apprehend me, if he could if this law was in effect. Uh, it provides funding for testimony. It allows for witnesses who refuse to testify to be jailed. It penalizes constables if they do not sufficiently rigorously enforce the law. It allows the property of those detained to be seized and sold to cover the costs of the law's enforcement. Uh, it expands use of summary trial. You can readily, you, you know, you can try these things through, through a summary procedure. And uh, like previous uh, vagrancy law measures, it allows vagrants, you know, among the penalties is, is removing the vagrant from uh, the place that they're in back to where they're deemed to have come from. So, right, so there's a, there's a lot going on here, too. So one thing is we're in the early 19th century. There are not yet most prosecutions, for example, in this period of time are still private. It's one individual to another. There's no, the, the system of public prosecution only evolves over the course of the 19th century in England. Um, so it's, it's partly about enforcement in that sense. It's partly that this is in the wake of sort of the big transition from the 18th to the 19th century from, you know, really serious um, exemplary punishments to, you know, a law that has much wider effect, will sweep up much more of the population, um, but will ultimately punish them uh, in lesser ways. So, so all of that um, context is relevant. Um, but what I want to suggest overall, right, is that this law is about, it's about the authorities thinking about how do we increase the uh, sort of enforcement power of the public authorities, right? We want them to have more power in society to be able to achieve their goals more. Um, and so, you know, and so in the vagrancy law, it's not just about defining the vagrant as sort of a category to be targeted by criminal laws. It is at least as much, and I would suggest actually perhaps most fundamentally, a way of trying to expand the powers of the public authorities. That uh, conclusion, I think, is also suggested by the fact that, so it's 1824 um, that the vagrancy law is uh, passed. Five years later, you have the Metropolitan Police Act, 1829. And this is, you know, uh, seen as the moment where Britain gets its first modern police service, right? Before this, they don't have anything like this, you know, that we would recognize as kind of a modern police. This is the foundational moment. So already the fact that these are very close in time, I think tells you, you know, this is a period where the authorities are concerned with expanding kind of their law enforcement, their public order law enforcement powers. But in fact, the connection with vagrancy law is made even more apparent by the fact the initial police acts aren't simply procedural or institutional, they also have substantive crimes within them. And one of the crimes in the 1829 act is basically vagrancy. So it says, uh, one of the provisions of the act says, any man belonging to the police force may apprehend all loose, idle, and disorderly persons. Remember, the, the idle and disorderly was sort of the, the first category of vagrants. Uh, disturbing the public peace, or whom um, that member of the police force shall have cause to suspect of any evil designs. And all persons whom he shall find between sunset and the hour of eight in the forenoon, lying in any highway yard or other place or loitering therein and not giving a satisfactory account of themselves, right? So basically it's in different terms, but giving the police this very broad authority to apprehend individuals if they find them, you know, in public and, and they seem uh, suspicious to them uh, in some way. Okay, so this is what we have in England at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but then, of course, this is also a period where Britain is, has, already has an empire. It's also expanding over this course of time. And uh, what we see with these laws in particular is that they are remarkably um, uh, prone to being disseminated. They go everywhere. Everywhere the British go, they end up passing uh, vagrancy laws. So I'll walk through a few different iterations 
uh, of that. So in India, there are, you know, in the first place, there are vagrancy laws, which are more similar to, you know, the, the, the first order type of vagrants. In other words, targeting beggars, for example, mendicants. But there are also these measures known as the Thuggy and the Coyote Acts, um, uh, which uh, uh, criminally penalize, um, you know, what are seen as sort of often described as criminal tribes, groups of individuals who the British see as uh, a sort of an Indian version of a, a bandit, something like that, um, and who they punish under these uh, headings. I would suggest these laws are quite similar to the vagrancy law tradition in several ways. Uh, so first of all, they define their target in incredibly loose and status-based terms. Note these laws, right? It's not that you've done a particular act, it's that you're a type of person. This is true of vagrancy laws, this is true of thuggy and deporty laws as well. Uh, second, they characterize the populations they target in these incredibly loose ethnographized uh, types of ways. So in uh, India, for example, the British characterized the uh, thuggy as um, idle and unproductive on the one hand and savage and barbaric on the other. There's a, quite an established literature pointing that out. What's interesting is that, you know, often those looking just at the colonial context think this was only happening on that side of the equation, but actually it was happening in Britain too, just in a more class-based, less explicitly race, racialized way. Uh, there's a similarity between the Thuggy and the Corti Acts and the Vagrancy Law, uh, insofar as both uh, aim at making the population in question more economically valuable for elites in the society. Uh, so with the uh, Vagrancy Acts, they're about forcing people into the wage economy. Um, with the Thuggy and the Corti Acts, they were about trying to use to a sort of uh, populations that weren't settled but would move around and the British wanted to fix them in place so they could uh, tax them uh, and uh, so forth. And in both cases, you know, as I've already noted with the Vagrancy Acts, they're closely connected to expanding the, the power of the authorities, especially the police. This was also true with the Thuggy and the Quirity Acts, which the special police services created in India in that period um, for their enforcement, new powers given to the authorities because they have to tackle uh, this very serious problem. Okay, so that's in India. Um, uh, another place where you see sort of massive reliance on vagrancy laws is in the uh, former slave colonies after um, abolition in the British Empire in the early 1830s. Um, uh, I think, you know, I, 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 I can't say comprehensively, but I would think almost comprehensively you will see a vagrancy law in every former um, slave uh, colony, normally quite quickly after, uh, following abolition. Uh, this includes, you know, the Caribbean uh, colonies as well as Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Um, these complemented a, a raft of other measures designed to, right, so designed to uh, uh, sort of uh, enforce order and labor discipline over formerly enslaved populations. So initially apprenticeship laws after emancipation happened, there was the former, formerly enslaved persons were forced to work for eight years without pay under these apprenticeship laws. So, you know, so much, so much for the same people as before. So, you know, um, uh, 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 very similar to the previous order. Even after that, right, you have master and servant laws, which are laws under which workers can be criminally penalized for even, um, you know, just uh, not showing up to work one day or not performing to their master's um, liking. These are very, very common around empire until the mid 20th century. In fact, you have past laws limiting who can move around. You have other types of measures um, controlling workers as well. And you have these vagrancy laws that will, again, sort of penalize people who move around, penalize people who aren't working, or just penalize people who the authorities um, find suspicious. Uh, in addition, um, here too, you have this massive kind of investment in police services, in, in expansion of the magistracy in the post slavery period, the post-emancipation uh, period, right? If you think about it, it makes sense. You formally, you know, slavery was its own system of um, compelling labor, of controlling populations, you know, following emancipation. It's a very quick movement to, you know, a different type of regime. Well, you have, a, you have um, this huge investment um, in uh, uh, ensuring control remains um, uh, even as that transition happens. And of course, as, as I've already said, all of these things are not unique to the post 
slavery context, but they are particularly forcefully um, deployed in that context. You see vagrancy laws in the British settler colonies as well. So looking at the trans-Tasman region of Australia and New Zealand, uh, vagrancy laws are passed sort of everywhere in that area between the 1830s and the 1860s. Uh, sometimes, often there are multiple, you know, you'll often see a measure like this passed and then passed again in a slightly different iteration uh, 10, 20 years later. Sometimes the law says its heading is vagrancy law. Sometimes it will be police regulations that will contain the relevant measures. The measures adopted in Australia and New Zealand were quite similar to the measures adopted elsewhere, uh, uh, but also perhaps had a particular focus on defining social boundaries, um, whether it be between sort of respectable civilized settlers and their poorer, more idle, ex-criminal um, settler, um, uh, co-settlers, or um, whether it be, you know, one provision of these laws that you don't see elsewhere are these measures designed to enforce separation between uh, sort of European origin settlers, especially, and the indigenous population. So section two of the 1835 New South Wales Vagrancy Act said every person not being a black native or the child of any black native is found lodging or wandering in company with any of the black natives of this colony shall not being thereto required by any justice of the peace give a good account to the satisfaction of such justice that he or she hath a lawful fixed abode uh, and lawful means of support uh, uh, shall be liable to punishment right so basically so you know you're also a vagrant if you're spending too much time with the uh, if you're a sort of a european spending too much time with a member of the local population and once again these laws don't come in a vacuum, they come alongside dramatic enforcement, that, you know, quick growth in the magistracy, um, growth in the police and expansion of the powers uh, of both. In the United States, uh, following its uh, uh, abolition of slavery about 30 years, a little more than 30 years after um, uh, in the uh, British Empire, you also see vagrancy laws, um, uh, often known as Black Acts, passed uh, in the South. Um, these are essentially for identical purposes to the purposes they were for which they were passed in the British Empire to um, limit the freedom of movement and bargaining position of freed slaves, uh, most overtly, and to criminalize them and make them into sort of second class citizens uh, at the same time. There's, in fact, some literature noting that the lawmakers in southern states um, in the wake of the Civil War uh, actually looked to the British Caribbean example in terms of thinking about how to craft their post-war orders. But again, it's not only in the post-slavery context that you see vagrancy laws being passed. Uh, in the North, in the late 19th century, uh, in the US, these go in the name of Tramp Acts, which is a different name for essentially the same uh, concept. It's a period when there's a lot of movement of poor population around the country in search of work. Uh, and so you see these tramp acts passed in response with the same sort of underlying purposes, functions, etc., cetera, uh, for which vagrancy laws are passed elsewhere as well. Uh, in East Asia, in both Hong Kong and the Strait Settlements, there are also numerous vagrancy acts passed over the course of the 19th century. Um, uh, these are often relied upon to deport the population, which is possible because, you know, the border is quite close. So if it's uh, the Chinese population in Hong Kong, the British would, you know, um, and pick them up for vagrancy, uh, deport them over the border. Uh, it was more complicated with sort of vagrant Europeans uh, because they would have to negotiate, you know, to, to try and think about where exactly to send them. So there's some archival files from the mid 19th century. That's the British colonial government in Hong Kong discussing with uh, sort of international shipping corporations such as they were at the time, who's going to pay for this individual to be uh, sent back to uh, Italy or what have you. Uh, and again, these measures are closely linked to expansions in the uh, strength, extent of the magistracy, uh, 
expansions in their ability to decide cases through summary decision. This is a real, really strong 19th century, especially mid, mid to late 19th century development, this reliance on or perhaps whole 19th century development, expanded reliance on summary jurisdiction um, and expansions in the power of the police uh, as well. Finally, in, uh, for example, um, British East Africa and Northern Nigeria, both colonized in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, you see, uh, uh, so this is um, uh, in, in both places, there is slavery in the societies in question that's practiced by the powers that exist there before the British arrive. And the British, like other European powers at the time, are justifying their expanded colonialism in the period on the basis of, you know, the rightness of combating those orders. Um, uh, as they come to challenge the existing systems of slavery, they don't replace it with what we might recognize as free labor, and but that discussing that would be a whole nother issue. But but again, they sort of put in place this set, whole set of laws we've been uh, thinking about already, including vagrancy measures, right? A whole set of measures to control, you know, um, uh, who can move where, whether you can move into a city or not, um, uh, 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 and also trying to drive people uh, into work. In both Northern Nigeria and Sudan, um, there's also provisions penalizing what are termed catamites, uh, which is essentially another term for male homosexuality. Uh, this is something vagrancy law measures also uh, are used to penalize. And also, again, as I said, you sort of in, in these contexts, especially, you know, it's very clear in what will become Kenya. It's very clear in South Africa how closely vagrancy law measures are linked to other forms of sort of limitations on people's freedom of movement, freedom of work, past law systems, you know, what will eventually become and come to be well known as the apartheid system in South Africa. Um, uh, I think there's a very close connection historically to the vagrancy law legacy here, um, but actually the, 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 the full historical work on that has not yet uh, been done. Okay, so we saw how vagrancy laws evolved in England. We saw how they were disseminated all around the empire. They go everywhere for some, some similar, some uh, varying purposes. Uh, to summarize, you know, those purposes include um, reducing the bargaining position of workers, controlling and limiting freedom of movement, policing and defining public morality, as well as the boundaries of polite society, uh, and better controlling urban spaces. My argument and suggestion, however, is that um, uh, in addition to and over and above and beyond and all of these things, and perhaps most essentially, that the expansion in vagrancy laws was um, uh, linked to this expansion and uh, expansion in the power of the institutions they were closely connected to, the police and the magistracy, um, and that all of it was there to provide the authorities sort of flexible institutions with a great reserve of residual discretionary authority they could use to um, pick up, punish in a variety of different ways um, uh, individuals whenever they felt the need, right? So it's about sort of expanding, you know, and there's an, there's an interesting two-level part to this because on the one hand, it's it, part of it relates to the transition from the 18th to the 19th century and different types of institutions that you'll see even in, in Western Europe, for example, in England itself, these developments are happening. And part of it relates to the expansion of empire in the period. So the British are arriving in new places. They want to expand their power and control. There's some, you know, and the two go, and that sort of the transition to modernity and the expansion of empire goes side by side in a way that I think sort of is in very big picture terms, um, uh, you know, we as historians haven't fully uh, figured out what, 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 what lessons to draw from that, but you can, you can see both pieces of that here. Um, now, uh, so we have this, so sort of throughout the 19th century into the early 20th century, we have this dramatic expansion in um, the geographical um, extent, the power um, within, with, and, and the sort of um, deepness within particular societies of vagrancy laws. Um, uh, I want to, you know, I think that's troubling on its own, but I want to link it to another development that I think um, uh, uh, also makes it um, in some ways um, uh, uh, 
uh, even more troubling, perhaps. So between 1885 and 1915, A.V. Dicey, who you see pictured here, published eight editions of his incredibly influential introduction to the study uh, of the law of the Constitution. One of the big impacts of that is that he is often uh, seen as you know, not quite the originator, but the real popularizer of the term rule of law uh, as it continues to percolate through to the present. Now, there are a few different ways in which I would suggest Dicey's definition of the rule of law was peculiar. Um, but for present purposes, what I want to note is that Dicey defined one of the most central components of the rule of law to be its resistance to arbitrary discretionary authority, and in particular to the ability of the authorities to arbitrarily deprive individuals of their liberty. Right? Now, given that I've been telling you that uh, in so this, the eight editions over 30 years from the late 19th to the early 20th century, it's a period where vagrancy laws are everywhere in the British Empire. They are heavily relied upon. Uh, in this period, and you know very clearly what they do is they allow for individuals to be arbitrarily deprived of their liberty. Dicey did not have a single word to say about them, right? I don't think he could even see. I don't think he could even see them, uh, uh, right? Um, uh, at the time. Um, and so one and and uh, uh, okay. So there are two conclusions I would like to draw from that. The first one, and this was my first one, is that that's very, very problematic, right? It's essentially he's helping to invisibilize these laws. He's doing this work to defend the idea that the rule of law is important. He's suggesting the British, British law is the same as the rule of law, basically. It is the most advanced legal system. And it's because it prevents arbitrary deprivation of liberty, but he's unable to see this mass arbitrary deprivation of liberty that's taking place at the time that he's writing. So in the first sense, you know, I have a critique of Dicey because I think he helped to invisibilize that through his writings in this really problematic way. But at the same time, and sort of as I, um, you know, kept thinking about this and in ways that relate to the subsequent, you know, final parts of the history I'm going to recount today, uh, I think there's another side too, which is that I think there is you know, uh, as much as Dicey himself couldn't see that vagrancy laws might be something his theory should be troubled by, I do think his theory as such is one that is troubled by this type of law. Um, and so I think by sort of putting out the ideas that he did, he helped to lay the ground for um, the potential future expansion of those ideas to address this type of area. And what we see if we move on in the history is that eventually that does start to happen. Um, so it doesn't really happen until the post-World War II period. There is some discussion of vagrancy laws in the colonial European colonial context in the interwar period in relationship to the work of the International Labour Organization, um, uh, which I could say more about if anyone is interested, but it's, it's sort of limited in various ways, that, that um, focus. But then what we see in the wake of the Second World War, starting in the 1950s, civil rights lawyers in the United States, supported by various prominent law school academics, begin a concerted campaign against vagrancy laws, winning various victories, first in California, um, and then finally at the national level. Uh, this is covered in this, you know, um, fantastic, but very, um, you know, very focused in on this issue, but a fantastic book by Risa Golubov, uh, Vagrant Nation, um, in great detail, um, which discusses uh, sort of how the campaign developed, how it managed to have the successes that it did, um, sort of where its limitations lie as well. Um, the ultimate result of this campaign was the 1972 Supreme Court decision in Papa Christou versus City of Jacksonville, uh, in which the United States Supreme Court found vagrancy laws unconstitutional on grounds of their vagueness. Um, and this is actually an important precedent, both for the idea that laws should not be overly vague as such, and for, you know, and the anti-vagrancy work was very important to the development of the idea that crime should be defined in terms of actions and not status. So the anti-vagrancy law campaigns are actually very important for certain fundamental uh, concepts in a way this, this book does a great job um, uncovering. 
Okay, so we see following the Second World War some success in pushing back against vagrancy laws in the United States. We see some similar developments in the other settler colonies, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand in the same period as well. In England at that time, there is pressure, especially against what is known as the Sus Law, the provisions of the vagrancy law that allow for people who seem suspicious to be detained by the authorities. Um, and that leads to repeal of that provision alone um, in 1981, although um, the law itself um, uh, perseveres until uh, uh, last year when it was overturned um, actually in the, uh, in, in the UK. Uh, in Hong Kong too, actually, it's not really known at all, but in, in 1979, the vagrancy law on the books was uh, abolished. Um, uh, so sort of doubtless connected to these, right, this sort of uh, wave of anti-vagrancy push in the period. Elsewhere across the former British Empire, um, I think, you know, there's some uh, different stories in different places, but uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, vagrancy laws largely persisted. Um, including in, in several African and Caribbean former British colonies in particular. Uh, in fact, the penalization of vagrancy can not only be found in the laws of these countries, but actually in some of their constitutions. And this has a very interesting history of its own. So the, what happened here is that um, the... Uh, uh, when the British Empire was sort of when the process of decolonization was happening, of course, Britain famously does not have a written constitution. They had recently taken part in the process of negotiating and agreeing the European Convention on Human Rights. So in the discussions about constitutions for former British colonies, they were looking to that document. The European Convention on Human Rights in Article 5 has among its provisions a clause passed on Sweden's urging uh, authorizing vagrancy-based um, detentions. This is uh, so. What? So this is the provision, sort of guaranteeing the right to liberty and security. No one shall be deprived of his liberty save in the following cases, in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law. So no, you know. And then one uh, uh, five one e says the lawful detention of persons for the persons for the prevention of the spreading of infectious diseases of persons of unsound mind alcoholics or drug addicts or vagrants, right? So uh, deeply problematic in every component of it, deeply problematic in that it associates all five of those things together, still part of the European Convention of Human Rights, which I think is, is you know, um, not great for Europe, um, uh, but uh, there it is, right? And so this became a model for the constitutions of various former British colonies uh, as well. Uh, Okay, in addition to that, um, uh, so there's some, so there was this wave of pushback in the, you know, starting in the 50s in the US, reaching a sort of a peak in the 1970s, 1980s. Um, but what should be noted is, right, the, the repeal of vagrancy laws doesn't mean arbitrary power on the part of the authorities goes away. Normally, there are other measures that are passed shortly thereafter that kind of reconstitute that power. So often this is loitering laws. In Hong Kong, for example, as, as I mentioned, the vagrancy law was repealed in 1979. The loitering law was passed in 1981. There was some discussion in the 80s and 90s by the law reform body of Hong Kong about uh, removing that law, but it didn't happen. Um, uh, in the US as well, you know, it's been, I think, very compellingly argued that uh, traffic offense laws play the role that loitering laws used to play. Americans don't, we don't live in cities you can walk around most of the time. So we take cars everywhere. Um, and, you know, and, and sort of, and so there's a lot of traffic offenses that also tend to give police a broad discretionary uh, types of, of authorities. So we have this sort of a wave of pushbacks, but there's a question of how, you know, and uh, uh, how far exactly those, those pushbacks go. The uh, final point I will note is that, so in addition to this first wave of pushbacks, there has been a second wave that has been centered in Africa in particular. Um, so there's sort of a history in, especially in Kenya and Malawi, both of which have sort of quite strong lawyer communities uh, of litigation, uh, challenging vagrancy and vagrancy uh, type laws. Um, there are also important decisions by actually over in the Caribbean by the Caribbean Court of Justice, 
um, by the Court of Justice of the Economic Community of West African States. And then most recently, at the end of 2020, there was this advisory opinion by the African Court on Human and People's Rights that sits in Arusha, Tanzania. So it was just a, an advisory opinion by the Pan-African Lawyers Union asking them, are sort of vagrancy laws compatible with the African Charter on Human and People's Rights? And the African Court said no. Uh, and it said no, um, uh, uh, not just because they're overly broad and vague, as the United States Supreme Court had said almost 50 years before, but also specifically said they violate the right to freedom from discrimination, to equality before the law, to equal protection of the law, to put to the, they violate the prohibition on cruel and human and degrading treatment, the protection of personal liberty, protection from arbitrary arrest, the right to a fair trial, and the right to freedom of movement. So a very wide, you know, pointing out all of the different ways in which you can see these types of measures um, as problematic. So, um, uh, uh, so it's been, right, so, so to zoom out, we have this long, we have a long prehistory of these laws. We have a real intense reliance upon them in the 19th century. We, that corresponds, of course, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just looking at the British Empire, but these laws are in every European empire and I think everywhere in the world, really. Um, but we have a real uh, intensification of reliance on them in the 19th century. Um, then eventually in the 20th century, we start to see some questions, some challenges. Um, and, you know, we have uh, especially sort of centered in uh, Africa, we have an, an ongoing wave of challenges uh, today as well. So that concludes my talk for today. Thank you uh, very much, uh, everyone. I will uh, pass over the microphone back to you.